This is Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast that explores different areas of the arts and cultural production with me, Paula Blair. Visit patreon.com forward slash AV cultures to find out more and to join the pod. Hello and welcome to the party. I am super happy to be joined for this festive special by Christy Smith to talk about that heartwarming Christmas classic, Die Hard. (laughs) Christy, if you'll indulge me a wee second before I bring you in properly, I just need to have a wee nerd out for a second because you last joined us for episode 18 when we talked about that other classic, Spice World. (laughs) This is going to be episode 81. One. Oh. and the mass is just a bit special all the threes <laughs> and nines so I just needed to point that out there for everybody okay. and now we can move on with our day <laughs> <laughs> I like the film choices I bring I like to show up and just lower the tone of the room <laughs> not a bit of it not a bit of it so Christy how are you first of all I'm fine thank you for asking you doing Good. okay doing all right <laughs> it's just creaking <laughs> to the end of 2020 <laughs> I know <laughs> Now, this film is your choice. Would you be so kind as to tell us all, why are we watching Die Hard? Well, I haven't seen it for ages, but why are we talking about (laughs) Die Hard? Die Hard has retroactively become a Christmas film. So Mm. it was originally a summer release. I think it came out in July of 1988. But it's set at Christmas time. It's a fantastic Christmas film. Yes, that's interesting because I was thinking about the big summer blockbuster would be a high octane action movie and we've still got that model because I was thinking about when we had talked about Skyscraper on the podcast ages ago and of course Die Hard is one of the models for that film. So I was wondering about that actually, I'd written notes about that so that's very, very useful information. There's not probably going to be a lot of useful information in this show because I think we're going to keep it light. (laughs) But that's not to say useful information is prohibited. We love useful information of all kinds in this show. It is a big debate that people keep having. I have already seen it on Twitter so far this year. Is is Die Hard a Christmas film? Go, don't at me, you know. So (laughs) would that be your opinion then that it's retrospectively a Christmas movie? I would say so, yeah. I mean, it's set at Christmas and it's especially it's set on Christmas Eve. And it's about surviving the night to make it to Christmas Day. I think that's a very Christmassy thing. (laughs) I think um, when you watch the film, I think the main character definitely thinks it's a Christmas film and they make a lot of decisions which make it a little bit more Christmassy. And I respect that. I really respect that. Okay. (laughs) Maybe we'll get some examples out of you from that. Go for it. Yeah. Okay, so um, so the the main plot of Die Hard is that John McClane's a recently separated man who's travelled to um, Los Angeles, California to see his wife and kids for Christmas Eve. He goes to a Christmas party at his wife's workplace, Nakatomi Tower, and there's a terrorist invasion and he's kind of caught in the crossfire. Um, He has to survive the night and maybe save his wife and maybe save Christmas. (laughs) I think, yeah, it's definitely it is. So the first person he kills, there is a moment where he has his body and he's trying on his shoes because John is very vulnerable and barefoot for the majority of the film. The shoes don't fit, just about his tiny, tiny feet. But there's a moment where he slides the shoes across the floor and he sees a Santa costume. He's like, okay, this is my moment. <laughs> so what he does is he dresses the guy in a little Santa hat and he writes a cheeky little message on the jumper and he sends it down in the lift to the people on the 30th floor just to say, hey, I'm here and I'm going to fuck things up. <laughs> but I think um, in that scene, it's really interesting. I think the clips on YouTube, I think it's definitely worth watching it and watching it shot by shot so you can mm-hmm. figure out the fact that you don't see what's in the lift until mm-hmm. Alan Rickman's character and the other terrorists see what's in the lift. So it's a big mm-hmm. surprise for us as well. I think it might be maybe the world's most alternative Christmas cracker that's ever existed. <laughs> sent down a little present and fair enough, it's a dead body dressed up. And then he writes the message on the jumper, which is now I have a machine gun. Mm. And then when they pull down the rest of the jumper, it says, ho, ho, ho. Mm-hmm. And if that's not an example of a Christmas classic of a really bad joke on a Christmas cracker, then I don't know what is. That's a very fine example. And of course, then Hans Gruber does repeat the ho, 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 doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty quip-tastic. I mean, do you think that's 
maybe I don't know maybe that's what they're going for maybe it's an 80s thing but I think that's a really nice point about the Christmas cracker joke and the idea of the quips in the quintessential 80s action movie yeah it definitely has the moments of comedy which are a little bit more ridiculous and a little bit funnier because they're happening in such an extreme situation yeah throughout the film there's a lot of references to Christmas music when John is in the limo to Nakatomi Tower, the guy who's driving the limo plays music for him. It's um, Run DMC's Christmas Time in Holland. Okay. <laughs> so when it starts playing, he's like, hey, why can't we have Christmas music? It's like, this is Christmas music. Mm. And I think that kind of indicates that this is a different kind of Christmas film if we're seeing it as a Christmas film. Similar to that when Al Powell is leaving Nakatomi Tower. So he's the police officer that's called to check out what they think is a false alarm. Coming to himself, it's let us go. So he goes, da-dum, da-dum, mm-hmm. delightful. And then he calls it the dispatch and he's like, hey, everything's fine. And then he's like, let us know, let us know, let us know. And then another dead body falls from the 30th floor onto his car. Yeah. I think it's very ironic that the use of Christmas throughout the film just to kind yeah. of highlight. It's not a great situation to be in, but definitely not on Christmas Eve. You have friends yeah. and you have stuff to your Christmas specials to watch for the next day. <laughs> And it is a way of, it's almost literally hooking him in, isn't it? You know, that John McClane casts the body out like a fishing line and catches the car nearly with it. And then he says, welcome to the party. Yeah. Uh, mother flipper. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to... Is it the same Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Yippie Kayak, another bucket? <laughs> that's the bastardization of it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I like the Richard Iowari approach. <laughs> <laughs> just to really implicate that right you're part of this you're not leaving dude you know you're here for the long haul I need your help you know (laughs) you brought up nine nine there as well I'm not sure if we're allowed to talk about it yet or ever because of the implications with police brutality and things and it all got very strange back in the summer about discussions around nine nine because it really downplays it's really a different universe in which the police are not doing that to people this is Die Hard as a, a real cultural pinnacle. This is it being heavily referenced in lots of other American TV shows and movies and everything. I mean, it's so shaped around so many of the episodes, so many of the plot yeah. points in 99 are shaped around Jake Peralta's obsession with this movie. <laughs> Even right down to the, isn't it, the wedding cake is Makatomi Tar. One of my favourite examples, and I did rewatch this was my preparation for this, as well as watching some clips on YouTube to refresh my memory. I watched the Bob's Burgers episode <laughs> called Work Hard or Die Trying Girl. It's where the kids, they're given a chance to put on a musical and Gene is obsessed with Die Hard as well. And so he wants to be Die Hard and then he gets fed up with everybody and he plays every part himself. He has this really cool song about Hans Gruber. Meanwhile, another character is doing Working Girl, the musical, and then they end up doing a mashup and it's pretty um, awesome. Can you think of any other, the impact of Die Hard or the references to Die Hard? Brooklyn Nine-Nine is definitely the one yeah. I go to because it's a big part of Jake's personality being that like one cop against the world. Kind yeah. of thing. You know, I think a lot of people when they're talking about other films, they'll kind of call it like, oh, it's like Die Hard, but instead it's in like a toilet cubicle. It's become like shorthand for just saying someone in a really tricky situation that they're not going to get out of, like mm. one person against the whole world. No question. I mean, it's an interesting model. What more can we throw at this guy? <laughs> 1988, I was trying to remember when the Lethal Weapon movies came out because I was wondering if, to what extent does Die Hard tip over into pastiche because there's just glot throughout the 80s of these really high octane, very shooty, very sweary, very, very male, testosterone action movies. And you're going, oh, come on. You know, I mean, I know it's fancy and it's a big summer blockbuster and it's a popcorn movie and everything but seriously how much are you expecting these people to survive (laughs) (laughs) well um i think with die hard i think the difference might be that he's quite keen to try and pass the book like it's not that he's found the situation that he's in he's not like okay i'm in charge of this now he's like okay i'm gonna set the fire off and someone will come and then they come and they turn around he's like okay i'm gonna radio for help and he radios for help and then they don't do anything they tell him it's a prank call and then when the police finally do come they send one officer and that guy thinks it's fine until he has to throw a body at this man and be like please help me 
so it kind of is a pastiche in a little way I think it's maybe a little bit different to the likes of Rambo or like an Arnold Schwarzenegger film because he's not doing what he's doing for like masculinity's sake it's just that I'm in this situation and no one's helping me mm. and even when the police chief shows up and when the FBI show up they kind of make it work yeah he's very begrudging the whole time he's why is this happening to me I just wanted to <laughs> see my family like maybe mm. the reason so you know, like when he dresses that body up for Christmas I do kind of think that a little angel shows up on his shoulder and it tells him hey you're the main character of this film mm. it's the exact opposite of Clarence in um, It's a Wonderful Life like that okay. that character shows up and's like don't kill yourself it's a really bad thing to do especially at the holidays you're a nice guy this little like cartoon angel shows up for John kind of like you're the main character you're definitely gonna survive this mm-hmm. let's make it Christmassy <laughs> I'm trying to recall if the Christmas decorations get shot up and messed up and stuff. I can't um, remember. I think they were very pretty and very there in some of the clips I was watching yesterday, but I can't remember if how trashed does the place get. It, it gets very trashed by yeah. the end. So I think they're quite like yuppie and 80s about it. So we've got big, what do you call it? The poinsettias, the big red flowers. Oh, yeah, yeah. They've got them everywhere. They've got the big tree. They've got mm-hmm. like a, a string quartet who aren't playing Christmas music at all. I mean, it's Christmas Eve. Spend time with your family. Don't yeah. be here at a work holiday for something else. Mm-hmm. But no, so he blows up the entire floor at some point so I would assume that the Santa doesn't survive that but <laughs> even then at the end there's all of the stocks and chairs are kind of floating from the roof that's just exploded and it does look like fake snow okay so even in the sense that all the Christmas decorations have been destroyed it's still very Christmas yeah it's the only time you will ever get snow in California is if you blow up a building <laughs> basically you make it yourself <laughs> it's interesting as well the connection between New York and Los Angeles Mm-hmm. that's set up and he's very much a New York cop isn't he in this yeah. other world and I mean there's isn't there a whole season of Brooklyn Nine-Nine that's a bit shaped because of that isn't there you know Jake and Captain Holt have to go into witness protection or something and they're yeah. they're out in LA for half a season yeah I can't remember if it's LA or Florida oh maybe it's Florida but, um... actually no you're right I always get yeah sorry you're probably right. Sorry, right. I mean, they're both kind of coastal places. S- some are no. coastal and really sunny, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's certainly for Die Hard, there's an East Coast, West Coast divide yeah. there. Yeah. When he shows us, he knows it's not for him. It's he makes too... a few comments like, oh, California. It's frustrating, the lack of... Because in New York, maybe it's a bit of an indictment on New York or something that, right, well, if I call, if I threw the fire alarm or if I did all these things, somebody would come. But in LA, they're just... Oh, whatever it's just a false (laughs) alarm or eh, everything's fine (laughs) what do we think of holly holly's a really interesting character i think Mm. we don't see a great deal of her but what we do see i think is interesting so when we're first introduced to the idea of holly we know that they're separated we know that she has a job which is better paid than john and that's why she's moved to la Mm. with the children so that she can pursue her career and he's been left behind because he doesn't want to go with he wants to stay in new york and have his job and then you see when he gets to Nakatomi Tower and he uses a really outdated touch screen with the air quotes because it's quite clearly a glass screen that someone's mm-hmm. just having a play a video on. So like, Look, mm-hmm. touch screen. She's using her maiden name at work. So she's going by Gennaro instead of yeah. McLean. For the purposes of the plot, that's really helpful because when she introduces herself to Hans Gruber, he knows her as Gennaro. So there's no link that she's important to this guy who's mm-hmm. causing so much trouble mm-hmm. like throughout the building. Holly to a certain extent she like takes on the mantle of defending the hostages so she's like mm-hmm. you know we have a pregnant woman get her something to sit on take us to the bathroom you know we she's very protective of, like the rest of her colleagues and she has a certain position of power in her workplace as well mm-hmm. like she's instrumental in the business deal of whatever they're celebrating the same day as Christmas Eve and they bought her a, a Rolex watch to celebrate so she must be pretty good at her job but I don't know if at the end of the film she goes back to using a married name she does have her little moment where she gets to punch the TV guy who um, essentially breaks into her house and threatens her babysitter with being deported mm. so we can interview her children on air. And that's why Hans Gruber knows in the end that she is married to John mm. McLean. No, I think maybe in the end she is kind of settled that obviously she doesn't have a workplace to go back to because it's completely destroyed. She may as well just go back to her married name and just we'll move <laughs> back to New York. It's fine. So she has an interesting character. I think maybe at the end of the film she's maybe not the most emancipated character the opposite happens for her in a way so she had her freedom and her financial freedom her career 
and everything and then it all literally gets burnt to the ground pretty much yeah so um at the end Hans Ruben's hanging off the side of the building and the reason he's able to hold on is because he's attached to um mm. Polly's Rolex yeah so they have to untie it and let him go so that's the exact opposite of throwing your wedding ring away to get rid of the Rolex is to return to being Mrs McLean yeah it's a really great point actually yeah because the prop really comes into its own and she has to sacrifice that symbol of her career and her success in her own right under her own name to save all their lives because he's trying to pull her with him well pull her with him and or try and get back up I was wondering as well, because like her, her name, Gennaro, I think that's Italian. And, you know, Hans Gruber, so there's a German thing going on, Austrian-German thing going on. And then McLean, I think, is probably an Irish name. So he's New York Irish. And um, he makes reference to um, being educated in a Catholic school as well as educated yeah. by nuns. And then Nakatomi is a, a Japanese corporation as well. The guy who runs the company, I thought it was a really interesting thing that they added in. They don't really do a great deal with it. But um, when Hans Gruber is trying to root him out from all the hostages to find the guy who's in charge, he's essentially reading his Wikipedia page. But he mentions that he was interred during the 1940s. Gosh, yeah, because it's so close to, it's only 40 years after the Second World War at this point. And there's some African-American representation as well. So I think it feels deliberately fairly global. I think that's sense. better to say. I think usually with action films of the time, you usually find that there's like one black character and they're kind yeah. of in charge of just speaking for their entire community. With Die Hard, there is at least four black characters who are like speaking named characters. So you've got Argyle, who's the limo driver. Leo is one of the terrorists. Mm-hmm. He's the, their tech guy. And you know he's their tech guy because he wears glasses. <laughs> um, and then you've got Sergeant Al Powell, who is the LA police officer on the ground. He's kind of John's support bubble. And then one of the FBI agents is black as well. So there's two FBI agents who are referred to in the credits as Little Johnson and Big Johnson. They both <laughs> have the same name. So I'd say Al's probably the most significant one. Before when you were talking about how Brooklyn Nine-Nine's kind of come under a bit of scrutiny at the moment for mm. being what's called um, copaganda, which oh, yeah, is like yeah. portraying police officers in a way which doesn't really reflect their behaviours in the real world. Mm. And there's quite a significant plot point with Al. The reason he's been on desk duty or the reason he has the shift on Christmas Eve is because he shot a child and he's not really willing to be doing his full role. I think he's been on paperwork for quite a while because he's not really willing to handle a weapon again. It's peculiar and I think it kind of shows the sign of the time during the film. Mm. that his redemption is at the end he gets to shoot the last terror Mm -hmm. but I think the story he tells he does show a lot of remorse for having shot that child but I mean he has done it and I know when I was watching it most recently yesterday all I can think of was Tamir Rice and how he was like a young boy who was shot Mm -hmm. in Ohio for just being seen with a toy gun that looked like a real gun I think it would be interesting to know why they made the decision to have that be part Mm -hmm. of the story it's never said whether the child was black or not like Mm -hmm. Al certainly is and I think if Al Powell's character was white I don't know if it's tricky certainly if they were remaking the film now I don't think they could justify having that plot point in there would have to be some other kind of this is my backstory this is why I'm not kind of up to it you know I've got a baby on the way I've taken the shift but actually I'm not comfortable handling a weapon it's very interesting I think that very much shows that the film is I know I'm rambling a lot but I think that shows that the film is of its time but if they were to remake it I don't think they could justify having that in I don't think you could have a character who is a good character with that background it's really tricky but I mean in a way it's more realistic that you know because you don't really correct me if I'm wrong but I don't know if you hear the circumstances or his side of the story as to well how he ended up shooting a child was it an honest mistake is it something in the training you know I mean there's not really space to go into it and these things come up quite flippantly I find in a lot of those 80s movies I remember re-watching Gremlins a few years ago it goes very dark at times you know the there's BBK yeah that yeah, yeah that kind of comes out of nowhere yeah. yeah it's really traumatizing you know it's really awful and it's such a dark dark thing I'm not going to describe it because it's really horrific but in the middle of quite a silly Christmas set horror film that's played largely for laughs I don't know if just somebody got the tone wrong or there was a mood for this in the 1980s in Mm -hmm. US cinema. I don't really know what it is, but there are some times you just go, was that what 
is that <laughs> they really go in there yeah. you know it's quite it really takes you back so it's one of those I think but yes it's difficult maybe it derails the whole the whole um point of what we're doing but there are plenty of police officers who are all kinds of colors who become I think it's a matter of training in certain cases or people can be racist against their own kind because of propaganda and believe in stereotypes and all sorts of stuff it's a tricky one yeah as you say like it's really really difficult to read that one but then applying Occam's razor it's probably the simplest thing it's somebody was just a bit foolhardy in the writing room one day you know (laughs) it's nothing deeper than that but yeah it's quite a shocking thing I'm trying to remember back to seeing skyscraper you know and that's the wasn't hugely popular it was the rock set in hong kong and i think the motivations are very i might be getting it wrong but you know it's very capitalist you know the terrorists are capitalists you know of the highest order and they're terrorizing other kinds of capitalists that sort of stuff yeah i think the nationalities of the people in this or at least their heritages in die hard are I don't know if it's just a ham-fisted way of having to think about the legacy of the Second World War or something. So Hans Gruber and even Holly, maybe they didn't think that one through, but you know, and Italians and Germans, well, there's resistance in Italy to be fair. So maybe that Holly's like the resistance fighter. Well, um, and say so you know, we make make reference to Hans being West German because it's pre the Berlin Wall falling. Yeah, I so always forget about this. Some kind yeah. of he's involved in some kind of pressure group, but they don't make a great deal of what kind of side he's on. It's just made clear that whatever group he was affiliated with, denounce him before he does what he does at Nakatomi, yeah, yeah. which is purely for the money that he'll be mm. making. Oh yes, one of the clips I watched yesterday, you know, when he gives his demands for all of the terrorists he wants released, yeah. <laughs> and there's a, the first thing he lists is five people in prison in Northern Ireland. You know, for I mean, it's the IRA, but they call it something else. Do you know? And then it goes on to list all these people in all these other countries. It's always a bit of a what <laughs> moments <laughs> the Americans keep doing this to me um, <laughs> things like that just make me think of the open and line of all of sex in the city is your woman going you know dating is very much like the conflict in Northern Ireland what <laughs> 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 well <laughs> maybe she's on to something maybe it is exactly <laughs> <laughs> And then when I was, we were watching um, Star Trek The Next Generation and Data talks about the unification of Ireland in 2024. Yeah, so we've got yeah. that to look forward to. But anyway, that was a wee ramble there. Well, it's all ramble. Then. Is this one of your favourite films, would you say? Is it a film you, you really love and keep going back to? It's definitely a film I can keep going back to. I think because it kind of builds and builds. So it's like the first maybe 30 minutes or just kind of John in the building trying to survive by himself and it just gets bigger and bigger so then it's John and Al and the police chief and then the FBI are involved Mm -hmm. and then it kind of goes back to just being John and making sure he can get Collie out of the building okay no I think it's really impressively made Mm -hmm. and like I say I love all the little Christmas flourishes when you see the Collie being killed John sees him being shot but he doesn't see who does it Mm -hmm. which means that there's a certain point in the film where Hans and John come face to face and we know that Hans is Hans, but John doesn't know that mm. Hans is Hans. And mm-hmm. Alan Rickman gets to do his American accent for a bit. Oh, yes, um, yes. Oh, and I think that scene's amazing as well. They're shot at such bizarre angles that if you mm. were to like tilt your head to try and get them like in line, you would mm. you would do yourself a damage because you're like really far left for one and really far right for the other. Like mm. the camera wants you to know that this is not okay. This is a really dangerous situation for John to be in. Normally, at some point in one of these types of discussions, we try and have some sort of nerdy business about cinematography and your film language and stuff. And I mean, in the clips, I was noticing there's a lot of white angle lenses there's a lot of it bulging quite a lot and it just looking odd and there is of course the super slow motion of Hans Gruber's fall yeah (laughs) from the tower it just goes on and on and on for ages it's a really drawn out death scene I mean and it's not even the death because he's very much alive when you're seeing him and it's just that moment of recognition drawn out so much in a way it feels like trauma porn (laughs) 
Because <laughs> you're watching somebody and it's Alan Rickman, of course, so it's really nuanced. I imagine this would have been filmed in real time, him falling against the green screen and stuff and onto a crash mat and everything from a high distance. But that being filmed and, and him capturing that nuance of, oh, 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 this is happening now. You know, I'm not going to make this. This is it. So it really forces you to experience that. I would say that's something that's much more difficult now in US culture post 9-11. And we're quite a while post 9-11 now. And of course, this is way, way before. And nobody would ever imagine that something like that would ever really happen. I imagine that's something that's actually quite difficult for people, possibly, to watch. Certainly anybody who has who remembers, you know, the falling man photographs and that sort yeah. of stuff. But it just the way they it cuts away and then it oh you see it from a distance. It's more you don't see any landing, you just there's this horrible thud on the sound track and the um I think is it Al and somebody else who's in the frame of them just that reaction yeah the police chief says I hope that wasn't a hostage yeah um, yeah put two lines but it's a big fall it is a very high height <laughs> this is you know mince meat we're talking here <laughs> I don't know if we can mention Alan Rickman and Christmas movies without bringing up something fairly yeah, obvious. Love actually. <laughs> is he more of a bad guy in Love Actually than he is in Die Hard? Good that, question. <laughs> oh, that's an excellent question. Do you have thoughts on this? Do you have a debate on this? I don't know. No? He's quite really a worse character in Die Hard. No. Yeah, I don't know. He's pretty deplorable in uh, <laughs> Love Actually <laughs> for Emma Thompson. She gets there. I would time. love to get a Joni Mitchell CD for Christmas. I don't know what you're complaining about. <laughs> uh, but no, I think in terms of Die Hard, there's a lot of the antagonists the right way. There's a lot of bad guys who are bad guys. Yeah. I think for all Hans Gruber is the ultimate primary antagonist of the film. And it's quite likable. He chats on with Takagi admittedly before he shoots him in the face. Again, going back to my favourite scene, which is the list. There's a bit where he's making a speech, which is like, we've planned everything. Everything's mm-hmm. going to go mm-hmm. exactly as planned. And he's just kind of helping himself to the buffet that they've set out at this yeah. Christmas party. He's a nice guy for uh-huh. all that he's not a very nice man. And I don't know if it's just because it's played by Alan Rickman and you just get the vibes off him or because of the way they've characterised the other people in the film. So you've got the police chief who's very keen to say that he's in charge when he doesn't really know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got the FBI guys who are really keen just to kill some terrorists. And they don't mm-hmm. mind how many hostages get in the way. There's the TV reporter who's just looking for a story mm-hmm. and he doesn't care that he's going to traumatise those children on Christmas Eve mm-hmm. or deport that nice babysitter. That may be their motivation can't really side with them in any way whereas with Hans he's still I don't know if it is just the Alan Rickman side of things or maybe there is something a little bit more that he's very charming admittedly he's just after money but there's something there there's a vibe there I think that's the word I'm gonna use there's a vibe even though he's deplorable he's still likable and that mm-hmm. can't be said for some of the other characters in the film and I think that's peculiar but I think if you had like say 10 people watch the film you'd be like oh what do you think Pan's group they were like I kind of like him mm-hmm. I think everyone would have that reaction whereas if you were like and what if you think of the FBI guys they were like they're the worst I wonder yeah. if it's something there's a point where Holly calls him a common thief and he makes a point to get in her face and say that I'm an exceptional thief. If there's something about being competent at your job that makes you a bit more likable than, than mm-hmm. the others. I wonder if there's something in that. He certainly enjoys it. I mean, he's not that good at it because look at what happens. <laughs> yeah, definitely charming and polite, thoughtful, contemplative, good with words. The film makes reference that he has a classical education. That's yeah, like yeah, yeah. Very, like, he's a really nice suit. And, you know, he's doing a lot of this in his second language. Yeah. <laughs> and he's seeing it until a point because he's got this gremlin that is happening. If it wasn't for John McLean, it would have gone dead smooth. But he had this scrappy New York cop who in no time at all gets into a vest and in no time at all even loses the vest. <laughs> he loses the vest, yeah. And it's just blood everywhere. I mean, he's really good. John gets really caught up, doesn't he? He's really... He really does. <laughs> How are you even really bad. at this point? <laughs> um, when he's on the roof and they're going to blow the roof 
and he's trying to get the oh my goodness he's trying to get the uh, I mean this was nearly copied almost shot for shot in skyscraper but in a higher tech environment you know when he gets the fire hose and manages to string himself up to it and he just gets lucky he just gets lucky because this thing totally comes off the wall and it just gets hooked briefly on something long enough for him to hang there for a minute I mean, and he's so bloodied that he bangs against the window and there's a big splodge of blood on the window. (laughs) A big part of Die Hard is how unlucky can you be with how lucky you are? Because it is that he gets off the roof just in time. His feet are cut up with glass by this point. He has to boot open a window to swing back in. Yeah. And then the wheel that holds the fireman's hose falls out the window and takes him with it. So he has to quickly untie himself. Just like how much sterling do you have to be on after you go through an experience like that? I like, know it's not, not for me. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's in ribbons. There's not much left of him by the end of it. It does get very similar in Skyscraper. It's a real homage to it, I think, where the rock just keep and the you know the rock he's playing a guy who is an amputee. He's using his leg, the prosthetic leg, to do a lot of stuff. And you're like that leg would not even at high tech as it is. This thing is shot to pieces. I mean, there's nothing left. There's nothing left of his body. There's nothing left of his preset. I mean, how are you even functional at this point? It's this idea of the non-super superhero. They just keep going and it's that drive to survive at all costs. And yet the bad guys are just dying really relatively easily. But yeah, I was just thinking actually that idea of luck is it a travelator, the moving floor. You know, there's one of those. There's a bit where, oh, there's guys who've been painting and all the scaffoldings around everywhere. One of the bad guy, one of the terrorists is coming for him. And John turns the travelator on. So the gun comes towards him because he's lying there and he's trapped under a scaffolding thing that's fallen. You know, and he's pulling the gun towards him to shoot the guy. Am I getting that right? To be honest, I don't remember that bit, but it sounds great. <laughs> Maybe it's Die Hard 2 or something and I watched the wrong be. thing. Yeah, because yeah, actually, yeah, that's set in an airport. So it would make sense that they have one of those. Um, ah, that's what it is. is. I was wondering why there was a travelator in <laughs> But again, that goes back to being like, how yeah. lucky can you be with being lucky that he's been through four of these films? He survived yeah. them all, but you have to get into these situations in the first place. Like, it's desperate. Um, what did you do in a past life? Because it's so unlucky, but as you say, he just things just work out somehow for him. And, but is um, that the power of Christmas? Who knows? Who knows? I'm trying to remember because I think Die Hard 2 is definitely set at Christmas. I think Die Hard with a Vengeance with Sam L. That one is New York, isn't it? And I'm going to be honest, I've only seen one and two. Oh, really? I have yeah. seen four. 4.0 is pretty pants as far as I remember. It was just explodey, explodey, explodey to the point where I'm actually bored of explosions now. A wee bit of a plot would be nice. That's as much as I remember of 4.0. It's I Heard with a Vengeance. It's not as good as the first two, but it's kind of fun. And I think that one's not set at Christmas. No Christmas, but Samuel L. Jackson. So, you know, things balance out in the universe. (laughs) If I'm remembering that right. (laughs) It's been a while. I used to really watch these films a lot and I just can't even remember it very well from years ago. (laughs) That's where we are these days. Just remember the explosion. Something mm. definitely blew up, that's all you can remember. Something always blows up at some point. Because <laughs> I remember a helicopter, I think, blowing up in 4.0. That's about all I can remember. I think Justin Long is in that one. And I only know who he is because he's in a really obscure comedy called Ed that I really liked. <laughs> There we go. That's how cool That's all you know works. Justin Long from. That's all you know Justin Long from, guys. What do you know? From, do you know him? Do you know what's he in? He's a new girl. He's an accepted. I haven't seen those, but I like him. What other things do we have to say about Die Hard? There must be loads of stuff. Do you think it's a Christmas song? I definitely did about 10 years ago. I haven't really seen much reason to change my mind about that. It's definitely a film I enjoy watching in December. Mm-hmm. because I think it is the appropriate time to watch it. I think it's weird watching stuff that has festive things in it and Christmas decorations in it in July. 
it's just not right. I couldn't imagine like being it being like really sunny and then just going into a dark cinema watching a film which is so much about Christmas and then coming out and it's still being sunny like yeah. <laughs> to have seen that on like the 15th of July it, it doesn't make sense to me I, definitely I, a blockbuster I get why it was a summer release more mm-hmm. than it is a small Christmas film when you come away with a woman fuzzies but so much of the things in the background are Christmas Eve they'll always be like tinsel mm-hmm. or a tree or like a little Santa or something and like I say there's like two bookended scenes where John like specifically makes a decision to make something Christmassy. I don't know it's a peculiar one I get why people think it isn't a Christmas film I think a lot of that reasoning is just that well it was released in July and they didn't want it to be a big C Christmas film but feels Christmassy to me yeah. what's more Christmassy than like surviving something horrible aka 2020 yeah. and getting to the end and having presents and seeing family and yeah. not dying fingers crossed I mean, I think a lot of us, if we watched it properly at this point of this year, feel a bit like John McLean. Yeah, it just gets worse and worse. Yeah, because you just feel like you're surviving, but you've got all these cuts and injuries and you're tired and your feet hurt and your clothes have been torn off and <laughs> you're angry at the world. <laughs> squeeze through an air vent you've fallen off a building but on the plus side your wife not yet ex-wife she's lost the child care because of the thing and so she's gonna need somebody to help with some child care so you may as well <laughs> stick around and isn't that nice you'd be useful for your kids for a change there's always a silver lining are there other films that you think are quite festive films that aren't typically or that there's a question mark over i'm trying to think if there's any oh. Others are are in this ambiguous category. Good question. I feel like the ones I would go to are like damped Christmas songs. Uh Like The Grinch is a big one for me. Okay. Like Mother's Christmas Carol. Like, yeah, well, couldn't be more Christmas if it tried, kind of thing. Yeah. But again, that would be an argument for Die Hard being a Christmas film. It's specifically set on Christmas Eve and it's got this build up and this build up to this thing. Mm. The same way that, like, I think It's a Wonderful Life all takes place on Christmas Eve where he's deciding whether he should commit suicide or not. Mm. Christmas Carol, any variation of is all set on Christmas Eve where someone has this big realisation and everything's different in the morning. I think the same could be said for Die Hard that John comes into LA on Christmas Eve, doesn't have a wife, hasn't seen his kids in six months, he's wearing a shirt and then once midnight hits, it's Christmas Day, his wife's using his surname again. He'll be able to see his kids, he doesn't have a shirt or shoes, but Christmas Miracle. Mm, Got the family back. And heteronormativity is restored. That's always the important thing, is that the heteronormative relationship and the 2.4 kids is restored and all (laughs) is right with the world. If your wife has a job and she she doesn't (laughs) want to quit, you just blow up that building. That's the solution. You just get that building done, get rid, get some terrorists in, (laughs) kill a bunch of folk. Chris's miracle all by your own hands all by accident (laughs) one of my I call it a guilty pleasure and then I correct myself because I think do you know what no it's just a pleasure I shouldn't feel guilty about it is while you were sleeping I haven't seen it for years I love while you were sleeping and I can't explain why (laughs) there's just something very special and warm about Sandra Bullock and Bill Pullman in a movie together it's perfect that does have Christmas themes as well, doesn't it? Because she's orphaned and she always spends Christmas by herself. That's why she has that shift where she saves him. Yeah. And then it's one of those films where like Christmas for them seems to last at least two months. It must be Christmas Eve when he falls under the track, but then yeah. she spends the festive period with his family while he's yeah. still in a coma. They have this prolonged Christmas because, yes, the accident happens around that time, so they don't celebrate Christmas. Everything's left as it was, and so it runs into the new year, I think. So there's that whole Christmas week, and then the New Year's party, and, and everything, and everything all happens, it seems, within a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little fairy tale almost. you know I suppose it's like the snow globe analogy that's in the film it's all contained in this little fantasy snow globe you know it's a little contained tiny world and it gets stirred up a bit and then it all settles you know it's just, it's a perfect way thing I love it I haven't seen it for a long long time but I do love I it I think if you go back to it you'll probably see some um you'll probably, I'll probably have problems <laughs> with it no yeah. doubt because that's the way everything is these days yeah there's the creepy neighbor but he's quite sweet in his own way <laughs> but that's that's <laughs> the problem isn't it it's that we I mean, have in his defense he hasn't snuck into the lives of a family of a coma victim claiming to yes. be the fiancé. So in glass houses throw stones, Sandra Bullock. 
yeah hmm. yeah that's true I mean at least your man is very very honest about everything <laughs> that is a very good point it's almost like of this group all tradition where somebody accidentally gets thrown into a situation and even though they've tried to tell the truth because I feel like she tries to tell the truth and it, again it's that thing of you're just going to keep encountering this bad luck mm-hmm. where it's going to go wrong <laughs> and you're going to try and tell the truth people are going to make assumptions you're either not going to be able to correct them or there's no opportunity to correct them so they then believe it and then it looks like you've lied about everything because that happens a few times here and it's very stressful but it's Mm. also really sweet as a little self-contained fantasy and it's a bit of a love letter to chicago as well which is nice because i don't think it gets a lot of those kinds of positive views of itself that's a whole other ramble probably about a teenage obsession with er and really wanting to go on those l trains those elevated train lines anyway I've got into Grey's Anatomy recently, so it's all about fairy books, all about fairy ah, books. Ah, okay. Where is it set then? Is it... Seattle. Seattle, okay. Well, that was Frasier for me, going up <laughs> Seattle. And I was with fairy books, because why would he lower himself? To exactly, thing? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably has like a fate and pony. Do we have anything more that's useful or inane to say about Die Hard? Oh, I can say many inane things. Yeah. I need to rewatch the whole thing again properly. I would definitely recommend it. Like, yeah. Watch it tonight or tomorrow and we'll meet back up and I can get your opinions on whether it's <laughs> Well, I always enjoyed it as a younger person. I think these days I'm too tired to see something out and it's exhausting. Just watch a <laughs> clip of it yesterday. I was going, for goodness sake. Is this Five whole minutes. <laughs> it's just an effort to sit here and see this guy going through all this stuff. This is <laughs> intense. I am. I think the Bob's Burgers version is very much my vibe these days. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so, they do, um, Alien as well, don't they? They do, yes. There's, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. It's an episode where Linda gets sick and she can't go and see the kids performing. Oh, yeah, so they all tell lies about what happened. So they yeah. embellish <laughs> what happened and Tina's story is based on Alien. Yeah, well remembered. I do love Bob's Burgers, I have to say. <laughs> But yeah, they do great pastiche, you know, they do a whole riff on um, spaghetti westerns, they do a Jaws thing too. Yeah, is it called The Happening, is that what it's called? Is it The Deepening? The, the something. Deepening, that's what it is. It's yeah. one of, something along those lines. Yeah, loads of stuff like that. There's Rashomon type episodes as well where they're all telling the different versions of the same thing. It's a good show. So I guess that's everybody's homework then, is stay safe and die hard. <laughs> please don't die please don't die don't die in any way (laughs) there's been too much of that this year well christy thanks very much for doing this i hope it was fun i hope it's fun to listen to (laughs) if anybody you don't have fun editing it and getting rid of all my "Mm," oh no that's not what i mean you'll edit it down you'll be like it's a good five minutes it's it's a solid (laughs) solid five minutes good content well this has been a bit of fun and normalish service will resume in january but for now we're just having a bit of fun a bit of crack on audiovisual cultures so thanks christy and thanks everybody else for joining thank you This has been a Cozy Peapod production with me, Paula Blair. The music is Common Ground by Airtone, used under a Creative Commons 3.0 non-commercial licence and is downloadable from ccmixter.org. Episodes release every other Wednesday. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music or wherever you find your podcasts. See the show notes for a video link if you need auto captions. Be part of the conversation with AV Cultures on Facebook and Twitter or AV Cultures Pod on Instagram. As well as Patreon membership, one-off support is appreciated at buymeacoffee.com forward slash PEA Blair. I produce and edit the show by myself and I am grateful for any support for this work. For more information and episode links, visit audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com. Thank you so much for listening. Catch you next time.